Rare Gem Productions proudly presents Entrepreneurially Thinking. Entrepreneurially Thinking is a presentation of BioSTL and CET, the Center for Emerging Technologies, changing the way you view new ventures and activating your entrepreneurial mindset, empowering you to create new pathways for business success in the St. Louis marketplace and beyond. Here's your hosts, Cheryl and Christy. Now let's get thinking entrepreneurially. Welcome back to the Entrepreneurially Thinking Podcast. I'm Christy Maxfield. And I'm Dr. Cheryl Watkins Moore. I lead our STEM Entrepreneurial Inclusion Initiative for BioSTL for the region. Hey, girl. How are you? I am fine. We are back, girl. You are? We are. You actually um, have been quite busy as usual. You've had a couple uh, events and evening with. Yeah. You've been on a few panels. Yeah. You're rocking and rolling. So. So glad you, you made time. Glad you made time for the show. So <laughs> glad to have you. for you, you dear. Good to see you. Season 10. We are into season 10. This is so cool. Building another winning season. We are. You know, first great guests, great interviews, wonderful yes. episodes, and amazing sponsors. So many thanks to our founding sponsors, CET and BioSTL, Woo-hoo! for Thank their continued guys. support. We yes. love you guys, and we're really appreciative of all you've done. Mm-hmm. And because of friends and supporters like you all who are listening, yes. we are able to continue to do our work as well. So mm-hmm. thank you for for sharing with your communities. Follow us with the hashtags EthinkSTL, Ethink Podcast. Stay listening. Find us on iTunes, Spreaker, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The more people who listen, the more likelihood we can continue to have the sponsors who help us bring the great people that we interview and so it's like us, a great yeah. virtuous cycle that we want to keep absolutely going. we want to be wherever you are uh send us um your insights too and, and story guests, right yeah, that you want to hear all of that exactly. so what are we doing today because you actually suggested a story i did you got your pulse on what's going on that's hot <laughs> and up and coming wow well this is an industry that's really up and coming here in missouri yes uh the stigma associated with cannabis use is quickly dissipating as many began to view the plant as a legitimate means to provide relief from medical conditions such as arthritis appetite weight loss often accompanying cancer hiv treatments severe nausea sickle cell anemia ptsd D, IBS, and chronic pain associated with multiple sclerosis and epilepsy. All sorts of things. It is a miracle plant. It's that's amazing been, what it does. That's been used for centuries. Uh, what's very interesting, though, is revenues from the sales of cannabis are staggering. Yeah, um, where it's been legalized, it has boomed. Yes, yes. So not to mention the newfound employment opportunities also thanks to some new legislation. Just how much in revenue, you may ask? (laughs) Well, stay listening. BioSTL is a proud founding sponsor of the Entrepreneurially Thinking Podcast. We want you to know about all the great things they are up to, including the BioSTL STEM Entrepreneur Inclusion Initiative and Fundamentals Program for early stage would-be entrepreneurs in the life sciences in St. Louis. You can learn more about all of BioSTL's programs by visiting BioSTL.org. And for your renewed and continuing support, BioSTL, we say thank you. Hey, I'm Derek Mays. I'm the founder and CEO of Real Cannabis Company. And thinking entrepreneurially means bringing a desired consumer need to the market in a way that's innovative and fearless. Joining us today are Derek Mays of The Real Cannabis Company, a St. Louis-based group that seeks to open a combined integrated cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, and dispensing facility. And he is joined by John Payne of the Amendment 2 Consultants Firm. We're really excited to have you guys here today. Thank you for joining yes, us. Yes, thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Great to be here. Well, and as we said, your finger on the pulse of what's going on in Missouri. So Missouri is one of the states to have most recently mm-hmm. legalized medical marijuana, mm-hmm. and we're in the early stages stages as a state Very. of figuring out what it means to license and otherwise start these operations. And you guys are in on the ground floor. Have I, do I have that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a fair characterization. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're like, it is the sub-basements, and we are yeah. there and ready to go. We're, we're, we're getting to the basement sometimes. <laughs> They're coming up. They're coming up. And actually, John and Derek, you guys knew each other prior to the amendment. Didn't you all have some type of working relationship? Well, we knew each other because of the the campaign for mm-hmm. the amendment, uh, but we've known each other for a couple of years now. Okay, good. Well, we always like to get a little background. Yes. So according to my notes, 
John has been researching cannabis since the eighth grade. <laughs> so not only on the ground floor, but since he was a babe. Oh, wow. Derek, I don't think you've been in the business quite as long. <laughs> since but I know you've got point. like three years under your belt of hardcore study and, and that. So, John, can you start us off? You know, what, what brought you into the field? And, well, uh, let's, yeah, let's start and with the beginning. she always likes to know, are you a St. Louis native? Are you a St. Louis native? <laughs> and, or, or if you're not, what, what's Where your you background? Where you come from? Right. So I'm, I'm not a St. Louis native. Okay. I'm uh, originally from Southeast Missouri. I grew up in Poplar Bluff. Oh. Uh, and, you know, I, when I was uh, still uh, in high school and even in junior high, I was on the speech and debate team and I started giving uh, speeches on why we should legalize marijuana, which. In eighth grade? Uh huh. And that, uh, it he did likes not... compelling topics. <laughs> wow, in Poplar Bluff. Yeah. In the PB. <laughs> it did not endear me to uh, the faculty, but uh, the, the kids all loved it. Exactly. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I moved up here to mm-hmm. St. Louis in 2001 to go to Wash U. Okay. Uh, and essentially, I, I never left. Ah. Uh, and then in 2011, late 2011, I joined a group called Show Me Cannabis, mm-hmm. uh, which was, uh, you know, its mission was to reform uh, Missouri's marijuana laws mm-hmm. uh, and have been involved professionally in uh, marijuana policy here in Missouri ever since. And then uh, in 2015, Mm -hmm. uh, we helped start New Approach Missouri, which was the proponent of Amendment 2 that passed uh, the amendment here in Missouri. In uh, November. Yeah, by about 66% of the vote. That's amazing. There were three amendments on the ballot. Um, it was a nail biter. It was a nail biter. I was I was really surprised that our Missourians picked the right one. <laughs> Thank you, Missouri voters. Thank you, Missouri <laughs> voters. And Derek, you are a St. Louis native. Mm-hmm. I went to high school here. I think that meets the. I think that <laughs> actually meets meets the threshold. That's yes. right. That's right. That's all that matters. You slipped in. <laughs> right. Right. I had a little bit of a journey, so I uh, went away to college in Atlanta and. Then went to law school in Iowa Mm -hmm. and then started my career uh, in Kansas City and went to Phoenix for a little bit, but made my way back to St. Louis about 2001. So your career was what? I was a corporate lawyer, ah. um, also uh, the intellectual property background as a patent lawyer and Mm -hmm. also focused on some compliance areas as well. Wow. And he's also an electrical engineer, which yes. means he's got, you know, like you, he's, over a, that. he's a double threat like you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> More degrees and letters than I can keep track exactly. of. Exactly. But about three years ago, you got interested in what yeah. was going on. That was before the amendment. And I would assume yeah. the opportunity to build friendships and working partnerships with folks like John. Yeah. In 2015, one of my buddies had moved to Illinois and, and made me aware that there was a program that was being built out there. And I became a little interested, but mm. soon realized that we had no chance <laughs> of getting a license in Illinois. is one of the most difficult uh, states in order to gain licensure. But mm-hmm. I became very interested, came back to Missouri, uh, spoke with some colleagues about it, and started getting involved and met John and the mm. campaign and started becoming involved in late 2016. Wow. Cool. Wow. So did did you always have your sights on entrepreneurial ventures or was this more of a the just the right environment, the right opportunity and sparked your interest? I can't say I've always thought about being an entrepreneur, honestly. Mm-hmm. I always thought I was going to be the general counsel for a large corporation, quite done frankly. That. Yeah. Right. Been there, <laughs> done that. Right. <laughs> so when this opportunity arose, it was a little bit of a surprise for me and for my family, quite mm-hmm. frankly. <laughs> but it really has become a mission of it of mine that mm-hmm. it's something that I'm just driven and, and motivated by. And it's, it's something that I feel like I'm, I'm built for. Mm-hmm. And so in, I guess in a way it's something I've always been looking for. Just That's didn't know amazing. Mm-hmm. So that it's really fulfilling something in you beyond the opportunity to start a business, which in mm-hmm. and of itself is challenging and daunting and all those wonderful right. things. But your connect, it sounds like your connection to it is even deeper than that. Does it, why does it resonate with you so much? Right. The reason I became really motivated by it is as I started learning more about the industry itself, I realized that there was a dearth of minorities participating. Mm -hmm. Um, And for a variety of reasons, many of them related to the access to capital or lack of the access to capital that many uh, minority entrepreneurs uh, Mm -hmm. find themselves uh, facing. And I knew I had certain skills, uh, one being the regulatory background that I had. Um, others being being uh, politically involved in our mm-hmm. community and, and then also having access to capital. Right. And so with the combination of all those, I felt that this is something that could probably be a good fit for me. Mm-hmm. And not only that, it's something that I believe I 
should do on behalf of not only myself, but my community Mm -hmm. and to hopefully position others that are similarly situated and into getting into the industry and being able to profit as well. And John, you see sort of a, I would imagine even a a wider lens view of what the industry is doing nationally and also in the state of Missouri. How common is it for their, for Derek, someone like Derek to um, be the owner of a company, be a minority owned cannabis company? company that's going into the market. Is that commonplace or are we talking about unicorn within our our fields? Uh, somewhere between those two extremes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's not as common as it should be. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not, you know, unheard of, but, uh, you know, it's certainly there are fewer uh, minority owners in this space than we would expect from, a, you know, just if they were a representative number uh, of the population. Uh, and it's for many of the reasons that Derek talks about uh, lack of uh, lack of capital. Uh, also, you know, it's a, it is a heavily regulated industry. Mm-hmm. And so that often means uh, and there's some rules around this in Missouri, not as many as there are in some other states. But if you have any sort of uh, 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 criminal offense, that can often, uh, depending on the state, completely exclude you uh, from the from the market. Uh, and, you know, there have been laws that have been disproportionately enforced mm-hmm. against African-Americans and other minority groups. And so that has a disproportionate impact. So there's really a social justice component of Absolutely. all of this, yeah. Absolutely. as well as the opportunity to make a lot of money. Because I think the statistics show that, you know, when you look at um, uh, those folks who use cannabis, mm-hmm. right, they are equally um, black, white, uh, equally distributed. But for those people who are incarcerated because of the use, it's four times higher in the minority population, which is. And as you explained, that that means you're excluded from actually participating in the industry once it's legalized. Right. And making a legitimate profit off of the. And it's it's really weird because when you look at what other industry where you have CEOs who were CEOs out here in making money. <laughs> they already actually know how to monetize they the product. They know how to monetize they it. They know how to market it. They market, understand the sales, distribution systems. Profit, all of that. But now they cannot legally participate. That's a problem. So by comparison, uh, had all the bootleggers of the 20s and 30s been precluded from (laughs) participating in the alcohol trade? Right. We would probably. You wouldn't have any whiskey. You wouldn't have any. (laughs) Okay. I just want to put it in perspective. Right. 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 Awesome. Or at least you'd have people who did not necessarily have the skills. Right. Uh, come into the industry and all of a sudden become extremely wealthy while the people who had been trying to sell the products, grow the product, distribute mm-hmm. the product all along. And had expertise in doing it. Had expertise in doing mm-hmm. it. Um, n- no longer had the opportunity to do so. And, I, and so that is something that really resonated with me and, and, you know, struck me at my core. At the time in which we were actually pursuing Amendment 2, I wasn't very well aware at that time of that sort of language being mm-hmm. part of the regulatory uh, requirements in order mm-hmm. to participate um, and, and looking back now, I kind of wish I had had the opportunity to speak up more about mm-hmm. that. And I see that there's a slow evolution now towards states allowing people with these sorts of backgrounds to participate. Mm-hmm. And I hope that one day Missouri gets there as well. But right now, you know, we just, really, we, just, we just want to get the industry off the ground yeah. and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get going and, and hopefully bring those people along as we can. So speaking of getting off of the ground, how did you start building your company? Oh, so basically the thing I knew that I could do well, and there's, you know, I'm a limited entrepreneur. This is the first time I've done something like this, but I knew that I could build a team. Mm -hmm. And so what I was really looking for were people who did have experience in doing this, particularly in regulated markets. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a couple of guys in Colorado who were actually operating in the market, Mm -hmm. Stephen Boone and Pete Sims uh, are guys that are in Steamboat Springs, Colorado area. Mm-hmm. And uh, made friendship with them, got to know them really well, um, hopefully earned their trust. <laughs> I, and, think so. uh, I think so. <laughs> and they're yes. on your team today. They're right. on our team today. Right. And, and so we've really, we, we built out something mm-hmm. that I think was looking like it was going to be special. Mm-hmm. Um, and then soon thereafter, um, I met a woman. <laughs> 
who had a, a tremendous background in terms of medicine and big pharma and entrepreneurial expertise and even Sounds diversity so and inclusion. Mm, and, I wonder uh, who that uh, is. Maybe Dr. Cheryl Watkins. Maybe, maybe, wild guess. And I stalked her for a while and somehow persuaded her to, to join our team as well. And we just knew that we had a really, really special yeah. team at that point. And, and, then, and then since then, we've also added Justin Gage, mm -hmm. um, a former NFL player um, and, and local guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, some other uh, key, key, play key yes. players as well yes. to our team. So I'm outed here. You are. Well, you know, <laughs> what we've always told our listeners is that we're serial entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Right. And so you had an adventure before I met you. Yes. You've had a day job. You've had a side gig. <laughs> you got another side gig. <laughs> So we walk the walk, right? Thank, or we walk the talk. I was gonna we're say, walking and talking, and thank, we're doing them both at the same thank time. Thank God my husband has a, has a corporate job. Amen we have to health that, care. mind you. <laughs> Which is God great. God bless the spouse insurance policy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But many of, I mean, we, I think, uh, I've been involved with Derek for about, what, two and a half years in business. And we know, I know his wife, I know his kids and all of that because we are a lot in of a, due diligence yes we were in a shared organization but actually building the business has been very eye-opening I wouldn't have joined it had not it been Derek and his background because it is highly regulated John like you talked about you know people getting into this cannot be faint at heart they need to go into it with their eyes wide open maybe John you can talk to some of what are some of the pitfalls when you look at these types of businesses what are the the issues that for people who are interested in this business, what do you think are the things that they need to be really consider? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a saying in the cannabis industry that you're not in the cannabis industry, you're in the compliance industry. Yes, ah, uh, and that's know the know, business you're in. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and that's uh, something that a lot of people don't really take into account. They just think, oh, well, I'm going to get this license, and then the money is going to roll in. Right. Uh, but it's there, there's a reason that it's you know there are above uh, above average returns if you do this well. But right. the reason is it's very challenging to yes. do it well. Uh, and so under capitalization, uh, you know, you you're going to have to expect to operate in the red for a while mm -hmm. uh and you know if that uh, drives you out of business then well if you're not you're gonna have a chance to make any profits right. competition right you need a yeah. long runway mm -hmm. and try to keep your overhead low and your burn rate under control yeah <laughs> all uh, those i've thrown out all the jargon <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but then also, yeah, just knowing that uh, you can lose your license if you're out of compliance. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if you're and not just you, but if you hire somebody that, let's say, mm -hmm. sells medical marijuana to someone who is not a patient or who is underage or something like that. Well, that, now you have a, a strike against your license. Absolutely. And if you don't do something to rectify it, you can lose the license altogether. And so everything that you've invested in this mm -hmm. is now is now gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is a very challenging industry to, to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And people really need to know that it's not something thing that it's you're not just uh you know selling weed out of uh, right. out of the trunk of your car <laughs> it's it's a very difficult thing to do uh and you know take all the necessary precautions and preparations and build a team that's really capable of executing mm -hmm. on all parts of it and uh, one of the things that i know we're faced with and i think a lot of the operators are faced with there are certain issues because this is a state-run business versus a federal type of business banking issues maybe derek you can speak to you know what is what are the, some of these other issues like we know you know when we talk about hurdles. barriers to entry right. banking <laughs> is definitely one of them right and then this 280e issue sure. maybe you can speak to that sure too. sure so banking has been an issue for us simply because most banks are not willing to take the risk at this point mm -hmm. knowing that the federal laws are what they are mm -hmm. uh, we've been fortunate enough to find uh, a couple of financial institutions mm -hmm. who are interested in getting into the industry, although they are taking their time and rightfully mm -hmm. so um, in order to make sure that they take the appropriate steps to mitigate their risk as well. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, getting banked is, is definitely a challenge. Um, but you need to, you need to do that in order to, to get the capital that you need, that you need to operate right. in these businesses. And particularly with us being a vertically integrated business, we're talking about significant capital. You know, you're talking about, you know, $10 million or more. You're mm -hmm. not going to store that under your, your mattress. <laughs> and so you have to find, 
find these financial institutions who are willing to provide the services for you that you need to and operate. And investors, because you can't go into a bank and say, hey, I need a loan to run this cannabis business. Traditional loans are just <laughs> out, of the question. Just out of the question. You think hey, you're going to go in and get a loan? Can I get a $10 no? loan and get some $10 weed? Loan. <laughs> not happening. Not happening. Right. And in regards to the tax burden in this industry, yes. that is a tremendous uh issue as well to deal right. with. John mentioned earlier about operating in the red. A lot of that has to do with the fact that 280E is mm-hmm. um, an uh, in, internal revenue code that prevents businesses that deal with controlled substances um, that are covered by the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, you cannot deduct any business expenses with the, ex- mm-hmm. with the exception of cost of goods sold. And it effectively can have upwards of a 50 to 70 percent uh, tax burden on a business. It's Stop very right difficult. there. <laughs> Say that again. 50 <laughs> to 70 percent of your profits can be taxed. <laughs> Will That's right. be taxed. That's right. It's because you cannot you cannot deduct normal business expenses that any other business uh, right. can deduct, and so it's it's very difficult to be profitable short of eighteen months, twenty four months, simply because of the tax burden alone. And that's one of the reasons that we we were looking at a vertically integrated business because you can offset those costs to other areas of your business. If you're trying to do a one a stand up dispensary, that's very difficult. So to when do. we come back, we're going to explain to folks what a vertically integrated <laughs> business model, easy for me to say, yeah. is and, and why it's one of those things that if you're interested in this industry, you better understand that lingo and as well as learn more about the vision that Derek has for the yeah. company and what John sees on the horizon as the state yes. moves forward. So stay with us. We'll stay be right back. Tuned. Purpose First Advisors is proud to support the Entrepreneurially Thinking Podcast. Purpose First works with entrepreneurs and the organizations that support them to accelerate business formation, scaling, and transformational growth. For more information about how to work with Purpose First Advisors on business model validation, financial modeling, core messaging, or other growth and profitability strategies, visit PurposeFirstAdvisors.com. CET, the Center for Emerging Technologies, is a proud founding sponsor of the Entrepreneurially Thinking Podcast. We want you to know about all the great resources they provide, including the Square One Ignite and Bootcamp programs, as well as the online startup toolkit. The toolkit has videos, articles, and other materials to help you build your business. For more information about CET's programs, visit CETSTL.com. And for your renewed and continued Continued support, CET, we say thank you. So I'm John Payne. I'm the co-founder of Amendment 2 Consultants. uh, And thinking entrepreneurially to me means anticipating the needs of consumers and knowing how you can meet them. Derek, we've been throwing around this term, vertically integrated business model. We've been talking about dispensaries. What is all this? So what are the the ways you can get into this market? Well, there's a variety of ways. Um, the ways that we're looking at getting into the market is being a cultivator to be a pro- so growing plant. I'm sorry. Yes. Being a cultivator means actually growing the cannabis plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also want to process, which means that we will be extracting distillate and we'll be packaging uh, the product. Um, mm-hmm. So ma- or manufacturing it sometimes referred to. And then we also have retail dispensaries. So mm-hmm. that's the three different verticals that we will be entering. And so by entering all three of these verticals, we, we refer to ourselves as being a vertically integrated business. Mm -hmm. And you maximize your opportunity for profit because each segment or vertical has a different cost structure, profitability potential, all of those things. Each of them are a separate line of business in Mm -hmm. and of themselves. They have, you know, it's their own pros and cons. You know, that's why when I met Stephen and Pete from Colorado, each of them bring their own skill set to each of their verticals. Stephen is a is a cultivator and, and Pete is an extractor. Um, so they're, they're skilled in those areas. Uh, and then you also potentially have other verticals such as distribution. Um, mm-hmm. You have distribution and then there's testing facilities in the state as well, although you can't both grow and, no, and, and no, test. It's no, a conflict of work. interest there. And I'm sure there's some folks who are selling manufacturing equipment, right? Like just like any other industry, there's a whole supply chain That's behind right. this. So mm-hmm. we call them the picks and the shovels. They're, they, picks they, they, and the shovels. Right. So the ancillary businesses um, come in. You have lighting concerns, of course, mm-hmm. and environmental um, concerns. Security. Security is a huge yes. aspect, you know, that you'll have to have a significant investment in as well. 
there's a number of different ancillary services. So and we, when we talk to entrepreneurs about getting in, taking advantage of new things like mm-hmm. NGA rebuilding in mm-hmm. North City, right? Everybody looked at that like, oh, I got to get a piece of that, right? right? And and you've always told the story, Cheryl, of, you know, if you're if you sell water, bottled water and you want in on the bio sector, do some distilled water right. products and you can be part of the supply chain Absolutely. of what is the bio. So it sounds like, too, there's different points of entry where you don't have to be selling or growing or processing cannabis to be part of the cannabis supply chain. Is that make, is that correct? And John, you're a consultant, right? Yeah. So uh, So I am. Talk to us about what you do. I am part of those ancillary services. Oh, look at that right there. There you go. (laughs) And so, you know, I was the campaign manager for amendment Mm two, and, uh, you know, we got this, uh, got this passed last year and, uh, a lot of people were asking, well, what are you going to do after this? Uh, (laughs) would you like to come work for us? And I, I decided uh, that this is not how I originally got into it. I mm-hmm. wasn't thinking I'd be part of the industry, but I just said, well, this you is a great doing opportunity. You were this in eighth grade, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there wasn't a thought that this was right. going to be an industry. It right. was just, well, maybe someday it'll be legal in some capacity. Right. Uh, but so, yeah, uh, we decided uh, myself and one of the uh, attorneys who was on the board of directors mm-hmm. for the campaign uh, founded a firm called Amendment 2 Consultants, uh, and we provide uh, you know government affairs and also application response support uh, to people who are applying to be uh, either vertically integrated mm-hmm. enterprises or uh, smaller enterprises that mm-hmm. are maybe just focus on one aspect of the industry. Uh, and then post-licensing, we intend to offer services uh, continuing in the government affairs, but also with mm-hmm. compliance work, public relations, that sort of thing. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, the application process. Uh, talk to us about since the amendment has passed, what's the timeline and what's the timetable yeah. for people to... We're recording now at the end of April. And, well, you know, in that context, you know, what do our listeners need to know about what the next, I don't know, eight to 18 months look yeah. like? Sure. So right now, uh, we are still in the process of the department writing rules and regulations mm-hmm. uh, for the industry. Uh, by June 4th, mm-hmm. uh, the department will release the final rules and regulations. And that's the Department of Health and Human Services for Health Missouri? and Senior Services. Health and mm-hmm. Senior yeah. Services for Missouri. Okay. And, and so uh, when that is, uh, and that will also, when they release that, they'll also release the final form of the uh, application, both for patients and also for people hoping to be in the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then from there, there's uh, the patients can start applying for their cards in early July, 30 days after mm-hmm. their, their uh, forms are released. And then the people looking to get into the industry, they have 60 days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there'll be a, 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 an application window. They haven't said exactly how long it'll be, but basically from August 3rd, probably uh, two, three weeks, something like that in August, uh, where you can submit your application to be a dispensary or mm-hmm. cultivation or extraction, whatever, uh, what, whichever of those you're looking to do. Uh, and then the, the department will have five months uh, so basically until the end of December uh, to uh, score and rank those applications. Uh, and then at the uh, beginning of next year, probably actually around this time next year, we'll probably actually see start to see uh, places open and mm-hmm. patients be able to go into a dispensary and purchase medical marijuana. So patients are at least a year away from being able to purchase uh, mm-hmm. with those who are approved. And unlike the way we think about medicine where I go to a doctor and I get a prescription. This is a totally different process. It sounds mm-hmm. like we're getting a card and being authorized to be a patient that can use this. So yeah. it's not like you're going to go to your physician and they're going to prescribe you and you're going to just be able to take a script like you would mm-hmm. to a pharmacy and get get your dose. That's right. Uh, so this is, goes back to the the challenge of being in a in an industry that is still federally illegal. Uh, right. You know, there are ways the federal government has said that they're not going to enforce a lot of their laws uh, as long as you comply with certain rules that they have. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still you know there are still uh, illegalities. Uh, you're breaking federal law by having mm-hmm. any sort of marijuana, uh, and part of that is that doctors cannot prescribe medical ah, marijuana because it. a prescription is something that would have to go through the FDA process right. uh, because. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. The doctor is saying you should take this. Right. Uh, and so what, what the system uh, in most states and in Missouri allows is that the doctor certifies mm-hmm. that you have a condition uh, that is spelled out in the amendment as allowing mm-hmm. you to use medical marijuana under state law. And so the doctor doesn't have to say you should do this. Mm-hmm. They're just saying this gives you the legal right to do it. Which I think from a physician standpoint. It yes, puts- doctor. <laughs> Doctor, 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 doctor. Uh, it puts the the um, the treatment in the hands of the patient. You know, they're then able to walk and take this attestation, which is like I have something, a chronic illness or something, 
and decide what the best treatment is for them. Of which, all the options. Of all the options, which I think is really great. So when you look at uh, having people understand medical marijuana is the first um, the first line that's actually been approved here in Missouri. We're not talking rec yet. So don't think that you can walk into a dispensary and take a look <laughs> around and see what you can get. You have to have a medical card in order to, to get access to this. So what are the challenges as a business owner, Derek, that you see um, with this whole timeline um, being um, out here is. now? Yeah. <laughs> Money is the first one. <laughs> you sound like cheap. every other entrepreneur. Exactly. <laughs> this is not cheap. So. I think what's interesting is the investor uh, network is different because usually like when we talk about investors in our entrepreneurial community here for product technology, there's usually some angels or something like that. Talk to somebody. You had to cultivate that network. That no network. pun intended. No pun intended. That's right. Well cultivate done. Cultivate process and. <laughs> I hope they didn't process those poor people. <laughs> so I did. I, I mean, like most entrepreneurs starting up, you, you first go to your family and friends yep. and tell them about what your interests are. And, mm -hmm. and normally you get some support, but the dollars that are needed to really you know, operate in this industry mm -hmm. are significant. And we had to really go out and, and tell our story to people mm -hmm. who generally you would think not be interested in hearing a story dealing with uh, illicit substances. Uh, but most of the people that I've talked to, mm -hmm. they've become really savvy about this industry or at least interested, at least curious mm -hmm. enough to do a little bit of homework. And we did a nice presentation and mm -hmm introduced him to, you know, who we are and, mm -hmm. and what we're trying to accomplish and and the the forecast for where the industry is going. Mm -hmm. And when people read that, read the story and, and learned about, you know, what we're trying to do and how we're about to go about it, a lot of people became very, very interested. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to successfully land um, a, a number of of investors and people who um, I'm, I'm very proud to have mm -hmm. associated with our organization. Mm -hmm. And so what have other states taught us? We're the show me state. So yeah. we waited for a whole bunch of states to show us. <laughs> oh my goodness. As consultant, as a business owner, what, what are we able to learn from them mm -hmm. that's going to help you guys and the industry be successful? So at least from uh, the standpoint of, uh, you know, shaping the law, the, the most important thing to having a successful medical marijuana program is having the qualifying conditions be appropriate. Uh, because in a lot of states, they have very restrictive qualifying conditions. Only a few medical conditions yeah. will qualify for use. Right. Uh, okay. And that means that, you know, there's not very many patients in the program, mm -hmm. uh, which really uh, limits how much public health, uh, sure. you know, right. good this can do. Uh, but then also people that are trying to get into the industry, there's not, the, it never, the industry never really takes off because there's mm -hmm. no patients. Right. right. Uh, and the big thing in there is, is chronic pain. Mm -hmm. uh, in states that allow chronic pain as a qualifying condition, that usually makes up between 80 and 90 percent of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do include that here in Missouri. Okay. Uh, and that's obviously important for the industry, but it's also important because that's uh, where we see the biggest health benefits. Uh, because if you look at the uh, the states that have allowed medical marijuana, there is a 25% reduction in opioid overdose deaths in wow. those states. Mm -hmm. And the effect is stronger the longer mm -hmm. the program has been in effect, which strongly suggests that it's not just a, that's not just a coincidence, that is causal. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's it's very important that that be included as a qualifying condition and mm -hmm. it will be here. And I think it's something that uh, has been both the, the people that are going into the industry, the patients, and the, the Department of Health and Senior Services all recognize that this is a, a good uh, opportunity for us to combat the opioid epidemic. I think also what was smartly done in Missouri is capping the number of licenses that are available for operators to get access to. Uh, we've seen in other states where, especially California and, and, and in Portland, where I think Portland has what a ten year <laughs> a supply of of uh Laces? product. Oh no, product. product oh. Um which has engaged pent now. Pent up demand? Uh, or a pent, pent up supply, not enough demand. <laughs> right. Okay, got it. So what it's doing <laughs> is actually you have a regulated market. Now that's going to work alongside of a uh, black market. Right. So it, it drops the price. You have all kinds of issues going on. California has, they did not get rid of their black market. So I think Missouri learned from some of those. How do you think as an operator with the capping of these licenses, uh, the competitiveness? 
of getting these applications, uh, yeah. getting applications approved? I think John and his team did a really fine job of kind of hitting a middle ground, providing enough opportunity for people who are well prepared, who can raise an adequate amount of capital to actually come in and get one of these licenses, unlike, unlike a state like Florida, which has like seven, seven. Grow, <laughs> grow licenses for a state of 21 million people. Well, you know, six million in Missouri, 21 million in Florida. Yeah. And math doesn't work. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> so having 60 grow license opportunities mm-hmm. minimally and 86 processing licenses, 192 dispensaries. I think that's a really fair number to, mm-hmm. and particularly to allow entrepreneurs to get their feet underneath mm-hmm. them and, and not have to deal with the price compression that's sure to come when these larger operators uh, eventually enter the market and, and things may change over mm-hmm. time, but at least allow this industry to get up off the ground mm-hmm. and, and people to have proper access to these, to the products. And limiting the number of outside players big players coming into the but market, I think. you have to have Missouri right. DNA, so to speak, right? right? Mm-hmm. 51% of the business has to be held by Missourians. So. I think after 13 years, I probably qualify as one. <laughs> Not that I'm going to throw my hat in the ring, but I'm just saying, I, I guess that might, might pass the muster. One of the questions I have is, as the amendment got passed and we're watching all of the regulatory stuff get mm-hmm. approved, I've seen more CBD billboards, oh advertising, God, yes. articles. CBD... Can you explain where that fits in all of this? So if people think like they're in the cannabis business because they're doing CBD or I don't know, I don't even know enough how to ask the right question. <laughs> Tell me what I don't know. Well, uh, the, I hate to say this, but it's a, it is a complicated question that does not have an easy answer. <laughs> oh, dang. Uh, but it's uh, so CBD, if it's derived from hemp plants that are grown legally here in the U.S. or in another country, that is legal. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you can't make any sort of medical claims about it because mm-hmm. that's uh, that would violate FDA rules. Uh, but yeah, because hemp is now legal because of the, the farm bill, uh, essentially anything derived from hemp is legal. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that is sold as CBD uh, is CBD. It, yeah, exactly. Is what it purports to be uh, and that it is pure. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, I tell people that, that are interested in trying CBD uh, to absolutely go for it. It might help them, but also be very careful about right. what product you buy mm-hmm. and go buy something that has you can find 30, 30 party testing results. So and hemp is different than what we're talking about in cannabis because of the different psychotropic qualities they're absent in cbd if i understand correctly that's that's correct so hemp is i mean it's the same plant but it's grown very differently uh and so hemp does not have buds uh and the buds are what uh you know typically have the the thc, THC. uh mm-hmm. but you can get you high mm-hmm. yes yes <laughs> Uh, but you can still extract CBD from hemp, uh, mm-hmm. although it's actually uh, probably not as efficient as it would be to extract it from a marijuana plant that has CB heavy high high CBD buds on it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just interesting to to watch this all evolve. How long do you think it's going to be before rec becomes legal mm-hmm. recreation? Recreational marijuana or cannabis? <laughs> cannabis, becomes, yes, like it becomes uh, legal here in Missouri. Is uh, that a foregone conclusion? I don't know that it's a foregone conclusion, but I think given the way that the the trends have been going in mm-hmm. other states, I, w- I would say it's likely to happen. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's probably a few years away still. Uh, it's certainly not going to be 2020. It's just the, the timeline doesn't right. work. Maybe 2022, 2024, somewhere in there is probably mm-hmm. when we'll have that conversation. Interesting. So, Derek, you're at the very beginning of a very long timeline for, for licensure. And then, as John was saying, you know, could be earliest this time next year when you're starting to open up facilities. What's the vision for the company? Mm-hmm. Well, our company is called Real. It's an acronym meaning relief through a lens of equity for access, particularly for people who have been disproportionately, disproportionately impacted in certain communities for a higher, higher quality of life. So mm-hmm. Real is going to be a difference maker, and particularly in communities that have historically not been able to uh, take advantage mm-hmm. of this industry in the ways that other places have. And so my vision is to not only provide the access to patients um, in, in areas that have not normally been able to have access given to them, but also to provide economic benefits in mm-hmm. education and uh, employment opportunities to people who have not Mm -hmm. historically been able to leverage this industry Mm -hmm. as well as others. And so that is where we want to be. But we also want to look eye to eye with the big boys Mm -hmm. as well when one day be on public markets Mm -hmm. and be able to um, 
provide the investor value that um, all of our um, supporters have given us today. Yeah, we don't intend to just stay here in Missouri. Absolutely not. No, this is this is the beginning and mm-hmm. certainly not the end. Um, mm-hmm. But we do believe uh, we are going to have um, significant opportunities for a variety of reasons that will uh, allow us to really compete in a big way. Um, against the uh, m- other multi-state operators. You're right. So you're making conscious choices about where to locate your dispensaries, your grow operations, mm-hmm. your processing operations. So you're looking in predominantly black communities here in St. Louis. Right. Not just. Well, we're, yeah, exactly. We're going to play to Not our just, we're going to play to our mm-hmm. strengths. We're right. going to right? play to areas in which we think we can get support. Right. Where we think that we can be successful. Um, we know that there's a lot of. Um, capital being mm-hmm. spent in these mm-hmm. areas that aren't necessarily frequented um, by others. But at the same time, we definitely want to make sure our reach is mm-hmm. going to be in a variety of areas. We, we want to definitely touch um, any and all areas in which people want to have high quality, consistent product that we're going to bring to the market. Mm-hmm. So accessibility, accessibility is really at the, at the heart of what you're trying to do. Make sure you're positioned well mm-hmm. from a profitability standpoint but also an accessibility standpoint Absolutely. because 100%. of the lens of what that, how real is approaching mm-hmm. and then job creation. Cause like you said, you're putting 10 to $15 million into operations right up front just to get going. That's a big spend and it's going to be in somebody's backyard, mm-hmm. right? That's right. Um, and then employment options are going to happen in somebody's backyard. Absolutely. And, you know, that purpose, that, that sense of purpose in mm-hmm. terms of, where you're making those decisions um, right. as a business owner. We we get to make those large and small, whether we're Absolutely. starting a, a very hyper local lifestyle company or mm-hmm. a potential uh, multi, uh, multi, national, right, national. You know, multi-state national conglomerate. Mm-hmm. Um, social as I like social to think of. equity is definitely a big part of who we are. Mm-hmm. We're focused on bringing the, the greatest investor value, of course, but social equity is where we believe that we will have some distinct advantages. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, Missouri right now has not elected to uh, take on any sort of position in encouraging this a social equity uh, view on as it relates to the industry. But we believe that through specific efforts, perhaps it being diversity plans, perhaps it being something greater than that, both in Missouri and certainly outside of Missouri, looking at the evolution of the industry, mm-hmm. that we're going to be very well positioned for success. It's exciting. It's exciting to see how building your business and making those decisions up front mm-hmm. when often entrepreneurs say, you know what, I'm so busy trying to figure out how to make it work. I can't really focus on how I'm going to make other things better for other people. And you're saying actually our value proposition yeah. and the way we can deliver investor value is to think of both of those things at the same time. That's right. They're inextricably entwined in Mm -hmm. in our view. For us, it's the core of who we are, and it's going to allow us to be successful in ways that other businesses simply can't cannot we'll have a moat around our business to a certain degree Mm -hmm. this is very exciting yeah so um john as people want to learn more particularly about how to get into the field what the regulations require all the things that um, your company can help them figure out where would they learn more about you and what you do so they can go to amendment2consultants.com, and that is the number two. Uh, and I would also urge everybody, if you're interested in this, you know, some of the m- most important resources that are out there uh, on this are absolutely free to you. Woo-hoo! They are the amendment itself, and they are the rules that are being published yes. by the department. Uh, that is that is your roadmap. Publicly accessible. Yeah. Go, go get them. Go read them. Uh, yes. If you want to be in this, go read them. And that's, you know, then then we can have a conversation about where to go from there. Awesome. It's great. And Derek, if they want to watch Real Grow and see where your what you're doing and how you progress over the next year and two where should people look www.realcannabisco.com now we are a website in progress so <laughs> we're getting there but that's okay uh, you can bookmark it and that way you can come back as, as, as right. everything progresses Absolutely. and watch the updates see the renderings of the different uh facilities you'll be building find out where you decide to locate absolutely uh, and and watch in real time as the regulations that john worked so hard on and derek's mm-hmm. been a part of as, as well um, come into fruition. So I know I'm excited and, and been fortunate enough to, to also have a very small role in, in, I was going to say Christy de Christina. <laughs> My maiden name. Yes. Now we're going right back to the roots. Okay. She is working hard behind the scenes. Um, Doing my little tiny part. Us with our community impact. Well, you know. Uh, this is definitely um, a, a huge focus for us. It, it's really understanding what, what motivates uh, the team and mm-hmm. the mission and the vision that you all bring to the work that you're doing, which was 
made it a no brainer for me. Yeah. Um, so oh, I'm really excited. It. Yeah. So everyone who's listening, keep tabs, see what's going on. Yeah. If you want to understand the formation of an entrepreneurial opportunity uh, from the ground up, due new to industry being totally built. new industry. This is what happens. People legislation exactly. gets passed and entrepreneurial opportunities get created. It's a case study in the making. It so, is. Uh, stay tuned and, Very and fun. stay listening and keep track of our guests. So thank you so much for thank being you with us. Thank you guys. Changing the way you view new ventures, unlocking your creativity and innovation, igniting your thinking about entrepreneurship. It's Entrepreneurially Thinking. Get connected and discover more. Visit EntrepreneuriallyThinking.com to listen to all your favorite episodes and learn more about our guests, hosts, and sponsors. Feeling inspired? Be sure to share your thoughts, questions, and stories in the comments section. And don't forget to leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. The best way to show love is to share and subscribe. Let everybody know that you're entrepreneurially thinking.